Oh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the very last session of what I think everybody will agree has been a hugely stimulating and enjoyable Alps conference. And, and I think everybody is going to go away with lots of new ideas to consider and, and lots of new contacts, and I'm sure LinkedIn is going to be very busy over the next few days. This morning, we're going to hopefully send you away um, full of energy. Um, we're going to um, change the format slightly and rather having a, a, another round of, of panel presentations, we really want to open up the discussion and involve as many people from the audience as possible. We've had so much discussion over the last couple of days that we could, we could have a very, very wide-ranging discussion. What we're actually going to do is, is focus in on actually what the topic of today has really been about. And we're going to really explore in some more depth the implications of the change to an open access economy. Because I think everybody can now agree, we've heard this morning, you know, we have the Finch report, it was a while coming, but we have it, it was a good report, it was sensible. Um, I think for the first time it was a, a report, and I quote, um, it, it was a, a report that it embraced the transition to open access publishing for scholarly research journals, um, and it, it recommended that we should accelerate the process in a measured way which promotes innovation, but also what is most valuable in the research communications ecosystem. And I think that's an important phrase to bear in mind, is what is most valuable in the research communications ecosystem. And what we're going to do this morning is let's sort of think ourselves forward, project ourselves 15 years into the future, and assume that we have made an, an orderly transition to open access. And we want to consider some of the knock-on implications that that might have for all the players in that ecosystem. How is it going to change our lives? Is it going to change anything? Or actually, will we find that in 15 years' time, it's all been a bit sort of emperor's new clothes and plus ça change, we're all pretty much doing the same thing. So the, the way we're going to work this morning, I, I'm, I'd like to welcome our very brave panellists who have agreed to start off some of the discussion. But be warned, you're all going to get involved at some point. Um, I'd like to introduce, first of all, Anne Kitson, who's the Executive Vice President for Health Sciences Health at Elsevier. And Health and Medical Sciences yeah. at, at Elsevier. Um, and has been there for, I think, 15 years. Yeah. After spells with, uh, uh, with a number of other publishers, Blackwell's OUP and Pogman Press. Yeah. And I'd also like to welcome to my right Stephen Pinfield, um, who until the end of August was the Chief Information Officer at the University of Nottingham, um, but has just taken up a brand new position at the University of Sheffield as a Senior Lecturer in um, Library and Information Science. So I think two very um, well-placed uh, panellists to, to make some comments from the different perspectives from, from um, e different sides of the scholarly publishing system. We are also going to be monitoring the, the ALPS uh, Twitter feed and we do encourage you to use this if you want to make any comments or raise points. Um, oh, I'm going to be waved at madly by either Suzanne or Audrey if something comes up. I know that we've already had one or two comments that I'd like to, to, to come back to. So please get involved. Um, have your say. Um, we will throw out a few questions, but um, as uh, we'll see how the debate goes, and if it uh, becomes very more wide-ranging, that's fine. It's your conference, and we want to make sure that you go away feeling that you've had good value from it. So, where will we start? Let's transport ourselves forward to 2027. Those school children that Vim was talking about, the 15% of Dutch school children who voted for the Pirate Party, well they're all going to be in work by then, they'll be either researchers, they might be in business, they might be publishers, who knows. Um, what will that world look like by then? A recent report I read, uh, I think it was uh, authored by Sally Morris amongst others, um, gave the, the number of 28,135 peer-reviewed scholarly journals currently in circulation. Very precise number I thought. Um, so, 2027, will there still be 28,135 peer-reviewed scholarly journals in circulation? Or will these have been replaced by a handful of, of let's call them PLOS or PJ type or Springer Plus type um, article repositories with, with no constraints on size or reuse? Or will we see something radically different? Stephen. Um. It's a very big question. It's a question, I guess, uh, this conference has been all about, and our professional lives are all about as well. I'm reminded um, in 2003, I think it was, um, as somebody who was then very heavily involved with the open access repository uh, movement, having founded the Sherpa project and developed services like Sherpa Romeo uh, Nottingham, somebody said to me, 
Um, how long will it be before open access becomes mainstream, before it becomes the norm in scholarly publishing? And I said then about 15 to 20 years. Now, this was at, a, uh, um, at an open access enthusiast gathering of those heady days uh, when those were taking place. And I think there was a shock in the audience because people said, expected me to say one to two years. Um, but I, I still think we're probably on course for that 15 to 20 year uh, period, actually, which takes us uh, not to 2027, but, you know, a, a fairly medium term um, there. And the Finch uh, review has, I, I think, will be seen as an important step uh, in, in that process. Not just the Finch review, though, the Finch Review report and the fact that the UK government has accepted its recommendations. You know, we had a select committee report in 2004, but the government didn't accept its recommendations. And so, although it was important in terms of getting the debate going, it wasn't so important in terms of uh, policy on the ground. I think Finch is more likely to be important. And the RCUK uh, policy that's emerged in parallel with the Finch review um, and ha has been informed by it, no doubt, uh, I think we'll, we'll start to get the ball rolling in a really major way in the, in the UK. Um, Vim also mentioned in terms of context uh, for today the EU policy, which I think is, is important. I would add to that two other things. The Royal Society recent report on open data which is um, an important report and is, is within this context of, of open. Um, and, and also the general atmosphere associated with the first six or eight months of this year where there was a lot of coverage in the mainstream press of open access issues. A lot of it associated with the Research Works Act in the US um, and uh, that, that generated a lot of discussion um, the so-called academic spring um, that led to a lot of this discussion. So all of that added up as, as, as adds up to significant momentum. In terms of, you know, Vim started off uh, his, his talk by saying, do we all know the difference between green and gold? Um, and, and, and everybody did. One thing, as somebody who's been involved in open access for at least a decade or more, I can say is I think the green and gold dichotomy is actually not very helpful anymore. That would be, that would be my view. Very often green enthusiasts see their, their way forward as, as an alternative. The, the, the two are seen as, as, as maybe even opposed to each other. As a, 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 as, as alternative solutions. And yet, if we look at things that are beginning to emerge in the scholarly communications arena, we can see repositories and journals interacting with each other and not being alternatives. If you look at, for instance, the way uh, UK or now Europe, um, PubMed Central is being used, it's being used in a context where a journal, a journal article is being published, but then deposited in a repository. And if you look at the way archive.org is used, you can see stuff deposited in a repository, but still the peer review and registration associated with journal publishing is still important. So they, uh, something's been going into a repository and also into a journal. And many of the models that are emerging use both journals and repositories together in, as part of a flow of, in, of information communication. I think that's quite interesting. And that's the way, personally, I see, see things developing. It isn't about journals knocking off repositories or the other way around. It's about the two beginning to interact into a communication uh, flow. Um, and I, I think that, that, that's the way things are, are going to go. So just a couple of other, other comments uh, before, I, before I finish. First of all, we've, talked, uh, we've heard a lot in this conference about deconstructing um, articles. Deconstructing the journal was something that was talked about 10 years ago. Um, and what we're going to see almost inevitably is probably the continuation of the, the text-based article, but that being augmented in various different ways by rich media, by video and audio, by interactive models, um, all, all sorts of things uh, like that. And maybe also broken down into smaller units of um, 
communication, nano-publication, whatever it happens to be, so that it's more machine parsable. That is becoming more and more important, isn't it, as a, as a, key, uh, as a key issue. What more of a flow of communication would look like um, associated with, say, social media, I think we're yet to see um, you know, the role of the wiki or blog-like communication and how that interacts with more formal scholarly communication I think is, is still an open question. How video is used. I mean, for instance, at the University of Nottingham, let me give you a concrete example. The University of Nottingham has used YouTube to communicate more widely to the general public. Uh, you know, there's the periodic uh, uh, table on, on video where you can just say click on I and you get a short video about what's it about, or the Bible decks which you can click on a book of the Bible and you get a short video about what's it about. Most of that has been about communicating with the general public, taking the scholarly discourse I- into a more wider audience. But you can imagine that happening in scholarly communication, can't you? You can imagine, say, um, an abstract by video. So you get the author discussing what this is about, and then you can decide whether you want to read the full paper or not. You know, that's, for it, that's an example of, of, of where rich media might be used more uh, profitably. The only other thing I'd say is we've got to maintain the strengths of the existing system. It's not about chucking all of that away. The strengths about quality control, particularly around peer review, are really important, and maybe can be augmented with other quality measures, which I think are important. The thing that the journal does really well is acting as a brand, as a recognisable brand that people trust. I think that kind of trust in the electronic and in the open access arena really needs to be nailed down so people know what they're looking at and they have certain brands that they they trust. And also material that is citable and you can build on it in the scholarly discourse. All of those are strengths with the existing system, the traditional system, which need to be uh, maintained. Mm, great, thank you Stephen. And Anne, looking at the, the, the <laughs> journal brand, the journal is the very convenient wrapper that we currently use for our scholarly mm. output, do you see that continuing through to, to, to 2027 um, or do you think that, that the, the, those indicators of value and trust may come from a different place? Um, I do think the journal brands will continue. I think there will be fewer than 28,000 for sure. Um, I think it's also beholden on the journals to evolve and develop. They are really journals are communities, and it's about developing, and, uh, uh, and that brand is about developing into those communities and other things that journals should be doing. So that could be having social knowledge work networks on top. Um, obviously, lots of journals have conferences as well, which is a, a very sort of standard way of, of talking to your community. So yes, I do think you'll be around. Um, I think. What we will see, though, is we will see um, the premium brands still surviving, and I think a lot of the smaller players will go, and that will be commoditized, and those will be the things that will, well, are going into the repositories now. And so I would say that it's the kind of the CD groups, if you will, that I think will could suffer quite a lot. Um, but I would also say that you know there is still. I think what's a shame about all this is the very small niche journals, the very small specialist groups where things like impact factors aren't that high because simply the population isn't that high. And I think it's important to support and recognise those groups and I think that is something that's unanswered at the moment by these large repositories Mm. Um, and certainly Elsevier and many publishers have quite some quite small journals that do meet some needs and people feel very passionate about and it would be a shame not for these models to be able to accommodate those. Mm. I think that's an interesting comment about the, the journal almost facilitating, facilitating a community and maybe in the future it, 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 we won't, it just won't be about the journal anymore. No, right? Those no. niche disciplines, it will be more about the community, the interaction, the, um, the, the, the data, the discourse that goes between the, the researchers and, and in a way the, the journal becomes you know, the, the physical article can go into a repository to, to put itself into the corpus of literature. Absolutely. But the, but yeah, the community yeah. gets its value through other, other channels. Yes, I mean, basically, a, a journal is just a carrier of content at the moment. And what we are seeing, what we've heard a lot at this conference is, it's not just about content, it's about services, and, of course, it's about technology. And I would see those three components being integrated, very much so. Mm. Um, and, yes, journals will develop other, other features, as you say, networks, dialogues, etc., topic pages and the actual article of, of record, if you will, 
could, could end up in repository. Mm. Mm. It's interesting. Do we have any comments from the, from the feed? Okay, we've, got a, we've got a discussion going on already. Can, is that? Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm here. Um, okay, discussion going on already about Open Access Article Fees. Um, if there is, will there be a race to the bottom if this, this becomes a, a, you know, a market that publishers are competing against each other? If so, what happens to quality? But we have another comment tied into that which is, or will there be a race to the top, as with university fees? <laughs> so anyone who, who made yeah. those comments, maybe, yeah. or who would like to pick up on anything that the, the speakers have, have, have said? Um, any other points? Particularly those, maybe, have, have we, have we, do we have a PLOS question? I'm really there? interested to hear from, from publishers, me. particularly, say, PLOS, <laughs> about this you know, the mega journal idea, mm. what, what, what it's doing. Mm. Plus One is actually very successful as a high impact factor and more publishers are starting to think about this as a, as a, a way forward. To have maybe high rejection rate journals at the top but then a very large mm. repository like mm. journal with, a, with a, maybe a different sort of quality threshold or a lower quality threshold maybe or you just don't select on the basis of interest to a particular community, you select on the basis of uh, a you know, particular quality mm -hmm. um, of work. Mm -hmm. what, is, what is that actually doing? <laughs> you know, some, some publishers have described it to me as maybe a cash cow. You get, your, you get your, you know, your major income from that and that helps to fund your high rejection rate journals. Is that the way it works? I mean, well, what's, what's going on there? I'd be very interested to hear. Does anyone think Ian from OEP is going to comment on that? Thank you. Yeah, just to pick up on that point here, Russell from OUP. Um, yes, yeah, Stephen, I see what you're saying, and obviously with, with PLOS, that, that's their model. They have a PLOS one, which is, uh, as I understand it, is making a profit and cross-subsidizing their flagship journals, which, which don't make a profit. But obviously there will be some publishers who have very high-quality society publishers who have a small number of very high-quality titles that, for whatever reason, they don't have the... the they don't have the... Um, uh, uh, an interest in launching a large um, PLOS One type journal. Mm. So they have only flagship journals which are, you know, high rejection rates. The costs of running those things are, and operating those things are obviously comparatively high compared certainly to PLOS One. Um, so I just wondered where does that leave us um, in terms of article processing charges for those journals for publishers who aren't able to sort of cross subsidise between those two different types of product? Any other mm. comments on that? Mm. Okay, I'll throw out a question, maybe a show of hands. I mean, the question was, was you know, are we still going to see this sort of very rich ecosystem with 28,135, or you know, give or take one or two, um, journals? Is that still a, a model that can exist, that can continue? Whether, if, if, if after all open access is just another business model, does that have any impact at all? on the titles that are launched every year, on, on, on the ones that maybe um, fade away over time? Or is there going to be such a pressure to, um, to, to publish all of the funded research um, in, in the, the mm. sort of peer review light, if you like, you know, repositories? Is, is that going to have a knock-on implication that there's just not enough material left for the rest? Or is there enough new material coming out of new parts of the world? that's going to take over? Well, I was just going to make a point. I think it's all about, well, I was going to use the word user behavior and the way that scientists work. So at the moment, there's the article of publication. That's how you um, disseminate your research. If you think about how researchers are working, um, I think what you'll see, that you will see a reduction in journals because what will actually happen is there'll be lots of things in the ecosystem about things like the data repository services, so people being able to scan data, filter data, etc. Um, and I think this initiative going on at the moment, I mean, people probably know that about 70% of experimental results cannot be repeated. So, in fact, today there was an announcement where I think uh, PLOS is collaborating uh, with a couple of other players to actually look at how they can look at the open data to try and help validate those results. So I think it's not, I think the article will not be so dominant and therefore the journal won't be do dominant irrespective of the business model of open access, mm -hmm. if you see what I mean. General? Agreement with that position, or does anybody radically disagree? Mark Carson. Um, I, I wonder whether there's a, a danger that 
I mean, already there's a sort of publish or die thing, and there's a pressure on academics to publish, and it, it almost doesn't matter if anyone reads your article as long as it's been written and published. And if, you, if, you, if we go further down the author pays model and no one's choosing to buy a journal, then that takes us further down this path of it doesn't matter if there are any readers as long as there are authors. And that seems like a kind of dangerous trend, and that, and that should be countered by some sort of... Um, uh, brand and community and discrimination that, that, that rebalances it towards um, it's important who reads this stuff, not just that it gets written. Mm. One, one response I would make, immediate response I would make to that is that uh, at least in the UK some of the, uh, some of the practice is pushed by the research assessment exercise, the research excellence framework as it, as it now is. But now the ref has more emphasis on impact, not just on the quality of publications. It is uh, prompting those uh, academics who didn't already think about how their article is being read um, and who's reading it and what impact they can demonstrate as a result of that article um, being published. So it, that, that's, that's definitely pushing against the idea of just publish and don't care if anybody reads mm -hmm. it. And actually I would imagine that the social network would almost sort of self-police that kind of activity that, that you know, it, it, as peer review evolves that you know, the, those, if you like, they call them vanity publishers, whatever, the, the, those, those authors who just want to get their material out will be somehow I don't know, blacklisted or somehow you know, disapproved of by the rest of the community. Maybe it will become that sort of self-policing environment. Mm -hmm. Fred had a comment to make there. I just wanted to uh, add a statement that is largely in agreement with the speakers up there about the power of the brand. I think academics will still give their firstborn to get an article in Nature or Science, <laughs> and then maybe their secondborn to the second tier <laughs> of, um, of very high-quality journals that uh, the publishing community produces. And uh, I think that will remain. Um, and secondly, the, what you term as the ecosystem uh, remains vibrant. And the fact that we can experiment with things like PLOS One and its children and um, the deconstructed, reconstructed, added value article of the future, which is many publishers already have, uh, we'll see this evolve. Mm -hmm. uh, I share the concern that uh, some small niche journals, uh, particularly society-driven that don't have the resources, could be at risk because the enterprise is moving so quickly. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the fundamental value that publications bring to academia will remain. I think there's another point as well. I mean, at the moment we're talking about open access, making the articles as is, if you like, freely available. I think there will be many more demands in 2027 20, about uh, the access being fit for purpose. So whether that's people with disabilities or whether it's somehow synthesizing that content again uh, for that particular audience, whether it's for patients um, uh, who are looking at, at symptoms or whatever it might be. So I think it's going to become more complex than it is now. At the moment it's quite straightforward that it's talking about pricing, but it's actually going to be more about how do we digest that information for use. And in fact, there's already debates going on. Uh, the Lancet is working on this particularly for developing countries. How do we actually um, somehow break that down so people can use it in, those, in different contexts and with different educational levels? Mm. So I'd be interested to see. I think there's lots of opportunities there for publishers, actually. Um, and I think you may see players coming in in that respect as well. So, well I'm, I'm really interested. In the, last, in the last couple of years, there seems to have been more experimentation than there has been for the four or five years before that. There was a, there was a you know, mid-2000s, there was a, a lot of initial kind of work. But we seem to be getting into a, a, a situation where more people are prepared and there are more players coming in, not just traditional publishers, but other people mm -hmm. coming in. I mean, the, for instance, the Peer J initiative, it's a very, it's a very bold initiative. Mm -hmm. It, 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 it's aiming to be, as far as I can see, something like a, a mega journal, but it's not trading off the successful brand that PLOS One had, you know, or that Nature could have if it, it, it set up a similar, similar sort of journal. And it'd be very interesting to see whether that and its, its bold business model, uh, its membership model, actually does work or not. But the fact that that's happening in this space, and I think is challenging 
um, all of the players involved mm. uh, is, is, I think, really interesting. And there, there are some publishers in this room who I know, um, I won't cite any names, who've been very um, innovative right from the beginning with business models, with dissemination models, with you know, technology, all, all of that kind of thing. And I, w I would say them, uh, plus a lot of other people in this room, and also new players between them can actually bring some really interesting, innovative stuff to the market. Mm. And actually just in the earlier session, I think it was Ian again posted a, a challenge onto the Twitter feed that says, okay, if we're, talking that, if we're saying that publishers can no longer charge for content but, must, but will charge for services, what services? You know, what are we talking about? And I think what you're saying there is that mm. it's, it's, we've all got to keep on experimenting, innovating, um, and see what it is that the, you know, if the cream will rise and see what, what services will end up being considered of highest value mm. to the community. Mm. So we might come back to that. Um, one more comment, then we'll move on to another topic. But go ahead. Hello. <coughs> I'm just interested. There have been several comments here about how the number of niche publishers, at least there seems to be an expect, expectation that their numbers will reduce. And it seems like as we move forward, as it just seems to me the opposite might actually happen. I'm curious as to why you believe there will be less of them moving forward. At least from my perspective, with the technologies that are coming out, I think it actually will become easier to publish content, um, at least at the small level, because mm -hmm. you're not dealing with any legacy relating to print or anything like that. You know, you're dealing with modern technologies that exist out there on the web. Why the thought about a reduction in their number? Well, just to clarify, w w were we talking about the number of publishers? No, I was just going to make that point. I think what we were saying was the number of journals oh, we think okay. is going to change, not, not necessarily the number of niche publishers, because I, I, no. would, okay. I think most of us would, yeah. would probably agree mm -hmm. that actually mm -hmm. the, the digital environment creates many more opportunities okay. to publish whatever that might mean in the future, um, okay. and actually in some ways uh, in, in the internet encourages niche areas of, of activity and interest, and so the there are lower barriers if you don't have the, 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 sort of the, the legacy or if you, you can move into a completely new publishing kind of in, uh, paradigm, to use Charlie's word from yesterday. Thank you. Um, I think there's just one more thing that we need to think about, which is over this time span, are governments and institutions going to have the appetite to stick with this? Because obviously we are in a, a global recession, as so everybody knows, and repository is very expensive, um, collectivity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think that's just some, and that, well, I don't think they will uh, completely back out of this, but I mean, what was it, 10 million David Willits gave? And if you talk to many uh, authors and institutions, they'll tell you that their publication grants are like, you know, $5,000 or whatever, so absolutely nothing. And indeed, there's already debate, I think, today on Scholarly Kitchen about, you know, block grants, universities giving block grants. Is that the way to go? Is it really the way for to benefit the research community in developing their science? So I'd be interested to see views on, on that rate limiting factor about government participation. Mm. Um, I mean, now they're interfering, hate to say it, they've got to kind of, you know, put their money in their mouth and, yeah. and get engaged. Mm. Let's move on to the subject of, of change. Um, we've, we've heard a lot about change. In fact, I think it was Mary Walter in the very first uh, presentation on, uh, on Wednesday characterised the, 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 the three topics of the meeting, new, change and open. I think we've covered um, a lot of those already. Change from the all, each player's perspective. We all inevitably have a change agenda to address over the coming few years. 2027, we, we anticipate our businesses will look rather different. Um, who do we think has the most challenging change agenda? Um, in, the, the, in the chain because there are um, publishers, there are authors and researchers, there are institutions. Stephen, you, you did some interesting work that was published in Learned Publishing earlier looking at the, kind of the, the readiness within the academic sort of administration to, to, to administer and pay article processing mm. fees and, and, mm. and actually that they were kind of, oh gosh, God, we'd have to wake up and do something about this. Um, and you know, there are many, many knock-on implications for, for vendors, for subscription agents, for distributors, who, who really has to grapple with this change most urgently, do you think? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think we all do. Uh, I think there are challenges for all the players in the scholarly communication chain. Um, just stepping back a bit, what, over the last decade in the open access debate, I think um, 
that publishers have underestimated the role of librarians and the librarians have under, underestimated the role of publishers. I, th I think that's been generally true in, in, in the debates and it's often been uh, polarised as a result of that. Having said that, libraries certainly have a major set of challenges associated with changing scholarly communication, particularly associated with open access. There's no, there's no doubt about that. Um, you know, I always describe the, 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 the role of the library as the three S's. It's uh, space, stock, and services. Don't like the word stock, but it begins with an S. Collections is better, <laughs> but stock begins with an S. So in the physical library environment, you know, you provide the library buildings and space, stock with, with print material, and services were acquiring, circulating that, that stock. And in the electronic environment, those three S's all have a role. You provide um, online digital spaces, um, and sort of guiding around them, the equivalent of the, the library space. You provide electronic collections and you provide services associated with those. And the role of the library at the moment is, is both physical and electronic and those interact. Very, very, a lot of what librarians are doing now is, for instance, designing spaces to allow users to interact with electronic materials. So designing physical spaces where students can best work with electronic and print. So that they're not separate, they're very much enmeshed. But if you think about those roles in relation to open access, um, what, does that, what does that actually mean? You know, a lot of the role of the library of selecting material, of, of managing budgets, of licensing material, a lot of that just goes, just isn't there anymore. So the role at the library, the institutional level, will undoubtedly uh, diminish in that respect. Um, mm. Now, Libraries are, doing, libraries are doing other things, um, uh, of, of course they're managing historic materials and giving better access uh, to them, they're still managing spaces uh, in the way that I've described, physical space as well, they're still providing advice, training, support and maybe that needs to be improved so librarians are actually in and amongst researchers to a much greater uh, degree. There's a new role to libraries in managing the institution's information assets the data, the learning objects, the other knowledge objects that are being produced and librarians are just beginning to get into that space. Um, repositories were the first kind of foray into that, into that role. And there's a potential role in managing the OA budgets, you know, and, and, and all the administration associated with that. But it does mean librarians have got to get involved in different ways in their institutions and interacting in different ways with the other players in the scholarly communication chain. So that, that's just an example of libraries, something I know about, but it's a major challenge. I'm not sure all librarians have woken up to it yet, mm -hmm. if I'm honest. Mm -hmm. you know, they've naturally favoured open access, most librarians, and haven't really thought through the implications mm -hmm. of what it means mm -hmm. for their profession, but it means significant change and diminishing at the institutional level and maybe working more at the network level uh, as well as new roles within the institution. Mm, mm. Do we have any librarians who want to, to respond or just agree with Stephen or, or make any comments about how, what their own experience has been like or what they're anticipating for the next few years? There's, a, there's an arm at the back there. Is it Nikki? She'll put me right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I just thought as, a, as one of the few librarians I'd better respond and say, <coughs> yes, you're absolutely right. And um, there's, a, there's a lot of change um, that we've got to address and we haven't thought it through. Um, I have to say I worry about librarians and physical space. I think we ought to leave those to facility managers. <laughs> <laughs> so Anne, from your perspective, you, you spend a lot of your time talking to academics, to editorial boards, to journals, yeah. to society. Yeah. And what do you think their change agenda looks like? Um, so it, well, it's interesting, if we talk about the editor community, which I think um, is a select group, what you're guessing now with open access really clearly here and here to stay is they are now beginning to really engage and what you're actually seeing is some anxiety. So you're getting fear and excitement. So they are worried about about quality, all those issues are coming up, they, you know, they hear about these rogue journals, there's a lot of myth and legend out there. So what, and also they're saying things like, well actually, is this going to take away author choice for where they publish? Um, if they're going to be mandated by a funding body that they must uh, go to, to a particular open access outlet. So I think, 
Are authors ready? No, I don't think they are. Um, also, as people have mentioned, they can be quite proprietorial, both forced by their institutions or their funding bodies where they don't actually necessarily want to go along with this. And even at conferences, we have quite a lot of issues about people sharing their presentations and indeed publishing those because it is so proprietary. So I don't think they are, are ready. Um, and interestingly, younger authors, and I think you've all heard this, are even more conservative. And I think JISC and the British Library also found this out. And that's probably to do with the infrastructure of academia, which is obviously it's rewarded on where you publish, on impact factors, etc. So they are quite scared. They want to go for traditional high impact journals, etc. And persuading them to go elsewhere is not always what they want to do. Interestingly, with PLOS One, one of the most cited papers a couple of years ago was one of my top editors on our current opinions journal. And I was kind of talking to him about it and saying, well, you know, you've, pub you've published in PLOS One, but he's still publishing with us. And he kind of said, well, it doesn't kind of, it doesn't matter. I had to get this paper out there. I want to move on to the next research project. This was not my number one paper for sale. So this, this was, you know, suited me in terms of fast publication and getting it out there. And I think that's the point, that it's about horses for courses and choosing the right vehicle. Um, I also think there's, you know, I'm not being harsh on authors, but I still think there's a very variable knowledge in terms of what they believe is open access. So, and they also, when they're wearing different hats, respond in a different way. Because an author is a reader, is an editor, is a reviewer, is a researcher. And I think you made the point about it being Jekyll and Hyde. Talk to them as a, as a researcher or an author, and they will have, you know, diametrically opposed views um, on all those things. So the fear on peer review, for example, um, you know, actually when they want to get published, they're frustrated by the peer review process. They want it to be fast. They want it to be transparent. But, you know, when they're in sort of gatekeeper mode, it's kind of, you know, you really must hold the line. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, it's I don't know what others experience when they're interacting with their communities, but there's, um, they're not there yet, and there's certainly not common understanding, I would say. Mm. And, and Stephen, at, at Nottingham, um, have you seen that engage, any engagement from faculty members in the open access agenda? Or do, they, do they get it? The engagement is definitely increasing, there's no doubt about it. Um, uh, yeah, I, 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 and I've definitely seen that increase. Uh, you know, a few years ago, it was enthusiasts, people who were particularly informed, or particular niche communities, like the high energy physics community, who were very, just thought, this is normal, why is everybody not doing this, mm -hmm. kind, kind of thing. But it's, it's definitely increased now. Research committees in universities are discussing this. You know, I, before I left Nottingham, I wrote a paper briefing them on, you know, Finch, RCUK, EU policies and saying, look, you've, you've got to develop processes and systems to, to cope with this now mm -hmm. and monitoring mechanisms and all of that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is, this is definitely being discussed at the top table in, and all the way down in institutions. And I, I think there are a lot more people engaged. The vast majority of researchers, though, will kind of, kind of go along with the community norms. So mm -hmm. there, are, there are people who shape those community norms, but there are people who just sort of go with it. Um, and, you know, that, that, why should they be experts in scholarly communication? They're experts in their fields. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, we've got to develop systems yeah, to, to make right. them work. And there's huge variability across disciplines. I mean, you all know that, you know, impact factor isn't so important in the social sciences. Life sciences is, is clearly very vibrant, and I think 69% of our authors will publish an open access article, this, you know, in the next 12 months but you go to other disciplines and you don't see the same thing. So I think the other thing is this isn't um, one size fits all and things are going to go at variable speeds. So you can't say in 2027 all academia will be on open access. I, I don't think that's going to be the case. I think there will always be a mixed economy. I think it is interesting though, and I was saying this earlier before we, before we started about interacting with researchers about their views. Uh, I noticed a few years ago that... Um, Publishers were largely interacting with researchers in their capacity as authors. And we're getting certain responses to certain questions in that capacity. And librarians were interacting largely with researchers in their capacity as readers. So librarians are saying, look, our researchers are telling us they don't have access to the literature, therefore we want open access. And, and you know, publishers are saying, nobody's asking for open access. You know, and it's because they were, I think there was a, people were talking across each other because they were asking different questions in different ways 
to the same people. And researchers have this remarkable ability to switch hats and, and their answer to be you know, in tension with each other even when they're answering those questions. That's the same as peer attitudes yeah, to peer review. Yeah. Peer review is essential until it's my paper that's being peer reviewed, and then it's an irritation. Um, you know, so I think we just need to be a bit more savvy in the way that we consult users uh, yeah. and consumers of the, of the scholarly literature or whatever and producers of it, because we need to make sure that we're asking the questions in the breadth of their role, not just in, in this narrow particular role, answer this On question. That day, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yes, Suzanne, sounds like we've got some... Something from the Twitter feed, which is actually, I think, Peter McKay and um, Charlie Rappel having a bit of a back channel discussion about perspective. I think you picked up on it then um, in, in, you know, seeing, are you asking the right questions? Are you seeing it from your perspective? Uh. What's the filter you see it through? I don't know if Peter or Charlie want to add anything to that discussion at all, but it was, it was quite interesting that that was coming out the back as well. Oh. We're seeing it from a publisher's perspective. Therefore, we are filtering, and so that's mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. And I just wonder if there's if there are any other players in the in the chain. I I, I hate to, to pick on people without having warned them before, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, <laughs> Bill O'Brien, I see you sitting at the back representing the Copyright Clearance Centre. It just occurs to me, you know, in in I know that the CCC has been very proactive about thinking about well, how can CCC continue to provide services to publishers who have moved entirely into an open access business model. Um, and maybe you'd like to just, just comment on that, Bill. I think it's okay from your perspective as one of those service providers and, and agents in the industry. How do, how do you see this change? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm the Director of Business Development at CCC and always looking for new and evolving models. And um, uh, CCC has a rich history of providing microtransactions and collections and distributions. Um, so for a number of years now, using technology-based products like our RightsLink product, we've facilitated open access transactions between authors and publishers by collecting open access fees, color charges, page charges, uh, directing author off-prints. We're looking for those new opportunities, too, to leverage our infrastructure and our global recognition to support new business models. and. Not all are clear, but it's a, it's a very exciting time, and that's why we're at conferences like this to hear from publishers and vendors and organizations. We'll be talking a lot about it here at Frankfurt, um, at London Book Fair on an ongoing basis. So our models continue to evolve, but there are some threats out there to our traditional business, but we're creatively thinking about leveraging our infrastructure and adding, again, layers of value and layers of service. We keep hearing the term in- ecosystem, we're talking to new people in the ecosystem that we've never really spoken to before, the funders and some of the other uh, emerging players. So um, please uh, call me, call us. We want to hear your thoughts and how we can continue to support publishers on a global basis. Thank you for asking. It's all about kind of reinventing roles, isn't it? I think that's really, that's the challenge. Um, You know, uh, as somebody who came it came up through the library profession. I thought for a while it was just librarians that had these moments of angst to say, you know, will I still be here in five years until I met publishers? Um, and, and now I realise it, it, it's something that's shared by publishers. But actually, you know, I went, just, I've just left the University of Nottingham, I was Chief Information Officer there, which meant I managed IT as well as library services. And believe it or not, the, you know, the IT profession has a similar sort of angst associated with it. The, the, the IT press is full of, is this the role of the CIO going to be defunct in future? Because this idea of technology being a kind of a, a department within a larger organization, when technology is so diffused and, and so consumer-based, you know, is the role of a single officer looking after technology something that has a future. So other professions have these moments of angst and it's about reinventing yourself in a new context. Mm. Seems to me. Mm. So uh, any other comments with hands there? The, um, the, the session is being filmed, so actually it would be quite helpful when you, when you, if you could stand up and kind of face the camera, so that we <laughs> get the, the front of your head rather than the back of your head, that would be terrific. Thank you. Hi, I'm Diane Scott, I'm publisher for the American Association for Cancer Research. And about changing roles, I was thinking not only do we need to change roles, we need to take new approaches and better approaches with collaborations. 
because we're duplicating so many efforts. And with all the budgets, you know, being under such uh, scrutiny these days, we need to work together better. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for that comment. We might come back to that later on. But before we do, I'd, I'd really like, is um, Jose still here from the World Bank? No? Oh, that's a shame. Uh, ah, what a shame, because uh, he, he was unable to, to go into his uh, discussion about retooling the organisation. I thought there was going to be some, be some interesting things. And I know I asked a question of one of the speakers yesterday, you know, where, where do we get the skills for the new types of skills that we need? Where do we find the people with the skills that we're going to need in our new reinvented businesses? Um, so I think the, the conclusion made from that discussion is that, well, it's changed all round, isn't it? And uh, uh, we're all going to have to be creative about finding our place in the chain, um, making sure that we continue to add value, um, and a, a call for much more collaboration and cooperation. Because they say, you know, we're we're not working in an, in an economic environment that is that it's you know in, 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 it's particularly healthy. So it's it's sort of it's our collective responsibility to make best use of the, of the, of the funds that are there. So let's move on a bit to te te technology, since you mentioned it there, uh, Stephen. That was uh, a helpful link. Um, we talk a lot about disruptive technologies. I, I love the fact that um, one of our speakers at this conference is the Director of Disruptive Technologies at Elsevier. Um, I just wonder what that means, whether she goes out and creates disruption. Or, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a nice job to have, I guess. Um, but we, 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 we look at products like Mendeley, we look at new entrants into the market, we've mentioned some of them today, and we, we we look at and, and we embrace in many ways the new disruptive technologies. I know it's a it's a tall order to ask people who aren't technologists to think into the future and think, well, gosh, what might disruptive technologies look like then? Are we going to be working with a whole new set of, of challenges? Um, I don't know if you've got any thoughts, or we'll, we'll maybe get some quick ones and then really have a look around and see if anybody else can. Uh, I, I know there's a few people in this room who've got a technology role and I might just pick on them. Will, Phil, be prepared. I think the important thing though about disruptive players is actually they are a force for good and they've really um, given publishers the stimulation they needed to actually get their act together because we've heard time and time again the article hasn't changed for 400 years and probably in the past five or ten years we've seen more innovation than ever before. I mean, obviously, we've got articles of the future. There's all the there's all the various widgets that people are plugging in. So I actually think these these uh, entrants are a positive force for good and something we should welcome. And I think in the end, it becomes a virtuous circle. And in fact, the the users will be served better. They get a richer experience, rich media. Ex so I think positive. Mm -hmm. Uh, the point about disruptive technologies is you often don't see them coming, and that's what makes them disruptive. Um, so it's kind of a difficult question to answer. But you know, if you look at uh, the big IT consultancy organisations like Gartner, the kinds of things that they are identifying revolve around um, mobile, social, cloud, and big data managing big data. You know, those seem to be a lot of the themes that they're talking about at the moment that organizations have to respond to. They respond in all sorts of ways, and the way they do the services to their users, you know, the kinds of devices they provide, the kinds of services, therefore, they deliver to those devices. I think those are the, the kinds of things that, that we're talking about, but it's always really difficult to predict. That it, um, you know, but you've got to you've got to gear your strategies up as organisations to be able to be agile enough to respond to those when they come, as well as keeping existing services going. That's the mm -hmm. challenge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts from the floor? Come on, Will. I'm going to pick on you at the RSC. Are you uh, what sort of disruptors are you considering? Is it, is it big data? Maybe is it the the shift away from pure text-based publishing? What are, what are the next challenges? Sure, um, definitely big data I think could have a, a massive impact in the future. Um, also potentially considering non-customers, are the non-customers out there that we could target with new services and very much following on what Charlie focused on yesterday, how can we better get into the workflow um, and provide data mm. in mm. different mm. formats that really meet the user's need as mm. opposed to the, the 400 year old model. Mm. Mm. And, and do, do we feel generally as, as maybe traditional publishing companies or as um, venerable institutions, research institutions, that we have the right skill set. 
uh, I took part in a, in a discussion at a meeting, an outsell facilitated meeting recently, and, and there was general feeling across all sectors of the information industry. This is an area that we really, really struggle with. Um, that uh, you know, we, we know that we need to get hold of you know data specialists, but where are they? Who are they? Uh, can we afford them? Um, are they going to be snapped up by the um, you know the, the, the Apples and the Microsofts of this world? And, and you know, does that mean that therefore we, we we simply shouldn't even attempt to have these people within our organisations? Actually, what we should be doing is partnering, collaborating. Yeah, it's going to be strategic strategic partnerships, I think. And we're doing some of the things like with Oxford University. We're looking at something in genetics. They obviously understand the data. We've kind of got the curation bit, and we're looking at an IT partner. So I think what you will see is it has to be all through strategic partnerships. You just can't buy in those things anymore. So hopefully it'll be a much more collaborative world that that level. I think one thing that you're often looking for when you recruit um, technologists or librarians in an, in an academic institution is people who, are, who can see the bigger picture, not just their professional role in particular. So people who are going to work on the business as well as in, in the business is absolutely essential. And, you know, uh, IT professionals, for instance, see their role as IT and they can move sectors, but they've got to be more business aware. Um, mm. By business, I mean the organisation uh, aware of, what, of the role that they have within the organisation as a whole. And that means often more outward facing mm -hmm. to, yeah. to be able to strike deals, collaborative working with other people. And in the case of, say, technologists, not people who are going to invent systems in-house, but people who are going to manage relationships with external providers, manage um, li you know, licenses, manage service levels, all of that kind of thing. And that's a, that's a commercial skill rather than a technical skill. So you need more people who are going to be able to operate in that, that environment. And that's really important, that sort of outward-facing mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. oh, a few hands written there. I know um, it's Nikki, I think, with can I just build on what Stephen said? We've just done a survey of digital libraries. We're building our own digital library um, to manage our, uh, collect our digital collections. Um, and the survey results showed that the skills that were most valued were those generic skills, the people who could do partnerships, who could do communication, um, who could uh, influence and negotiate, understood business. And the requirement for specialist skills was much lower. Mm. That's very interesting. Mm. Yeah. Mark, just in front. Sorry, if we could have a microphone to the gentleman here. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm a great fan of disruptive technologies and, and innovation, all those things. But also, my favourite job title of this summer is from the British Olympic cycling team, where there's a guy whose job title is head of marginal gains. And I think there's also a lot to be said for very incremental progression, and, and I'm not saying being, being passive about it, but actually aggressively but, but marginally moving things forward and, and, and business models and technologies to, to just in, in, increment them all the time. Mm, that's interesting, yes. And that's, it was another hand raised towards the back earlier. Hi, Ruth Wells from Publishing Technology. Um, I just wanted to say that um, there seems to be an assumption that we have to recruit externally from our business and get those IT skills in and what we could do is look at it the other way and say we have those business skills and those commercial acumen already we attract people within the educational publishing industry who are very intelligent and ready to learn so why not train the IT skill? It's a combination I would say mm. it's a combination of uh, hiring from outside mm. and reskilling mm. existing staff and getting that balance yeah. right is important, but uh, and there's got to be a willingness on the part of the staff to be reskilled and to buy into that process. And many staff there is, so you mm. know that's very positive. Mm. Okay, are there any other comments before we move on? Yeah, there's a very lively discussion going on on Twitter. There's lots and lots of different comments in different different areas, but one um, that we could maybe pick up on that we haven't picked up on yet is the difference in the challenges faced by different subject areas. So from social sciences through to STM, this, this has all seemed to start as a very STM open access thing. And I know I've had discussions with social sciences publishers, who are some of whom completely have their heads in the sand about this. There's nothing to do with them open access. And I'm battling trying to convince them that actually it's come in your way, look out. So we could maybe pick up on some points there. 
know, you're very in the health and medicine. Yeah, I mean, yes, I mean, we see that. I mean, my field, well, I was life sciences, I'm now in health. So, I mean, obviously, there are two very vibrant communities. Interestingly, life science is clearly the leader, and, and as I said, more, more than two thirds of authors are going to publish in open access. So, to give you a contrast in the health space, particularly in North America, because there's a lot of high value services there, nothing to do with publishing or ours. Um, it's a bit lower, um, and people are a little bit worried about open access and the implications. And also, of course, you have ethical issues there, conflicts of interest and disclosures, etc. Um, so, so certainly, so there, for example, it's, it's only half of authors are going to do it. Um, and also, in health, it's a much more mixed community of researchers and clinicians. And the clinicians just aren't that interested. They have very busy jobs, so they just want to published. They're not engaging with the open access debate per se, um, or they're just beginning to, but it's, so there's a bit of a lopsided view, if you like, within my own market. Um, you're right about social sciences, but I think they are catching up. I think we heard earlier in this conference that e um, economics uh, in particular is catching on now. And of course, they used to have page charges anyway, mm -hmm. which is just a publishing fee. And I was interested with, with the World Bank guy referring to publishing fees. I mean, it's all pay to publish under a different name. So I think what we're just seeing is, is cultures adapting to the language and the semantics and that those groups will come along as well. But interestingly, engineers and physical scientists, um, it, certainly in my experience, aren't that engaged with it. Um, but I don't know what other people have found. And so it was quite striking, Vim's um, pie chart that showed a pretty mm. you know, broad spread Mm. Uh, engagement. So. I was interested in that because uh, my experience at Nottingham where we ha we've had a, an open access central fund since 2006, as far as I know we are the first UK institution to set one up, um, that is used, uh, the lion's share of that is, is, is life and medical sciences. Mm. Um, and mm. uh, engineers engagement was in a single percentage yeah. point, it really was small mm. and humanities non-existent. I think we'd have one article or something in, in the whole history of the fund. So, uh, you know, that's what you'd expect mm. to see. So I was interested that, you know, open access journals or hybrid journals are, you know, being used uh, in, in more generally across, yeah. across the board. I think, I think it is interesting that, you know, the cultures of communication differ. And this, this, the assumption is that, you know, the open access model does sit best with the with the journal, with journal publishing rather than monograph publishing to start off with, and for funded research, you know, and many uh, humanities mm. scholars and social scientists to a certain extent are not funded in the same way. Or mathematicians. Mm. Indeed, yeah. 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 Ma you know, maths can sometimes operate a bit more like a humanities yes. subject yeah. than it can, uh, particularly in the very pure side. So yeah, I think that's really interesting. Now, our open access fund at Nottingham was explicitly for all disciplines, whether people were funded by RCUK or not. And I, I argued very strongly there that, well, hold on a minute, you know, we, we pay for journal subscriptions via government money, via research money and hefty block grants. We don't say, well, you have to be funded by uh, an RCUK grant to look at this journal. You know, we actually say this is a common good for everybody in the institution. So if we're setting up a, a, an open access fund, we should do the same. We should say it's for everybody and it's centrally funded from these block grants, etc. So now there is a, a, a real possibility of research councils, etc., providing these block grants to institutions. It'll be interesting to see how institutions choose to administer them. Because my view is they can enable open access publishing across the board if they say these funds are available for everybody, not yeah. just funded researchers. And you know, the wise administrators in, in institutions should do that, in my, in my view. The wise administrators? They're not all wise. Are they? <laughs> <laughs> um, just slightly moving, we talked there about um, subject um, differences. Um, I'm interested also in, in the geographical differences that we might see. We've seen the previous conferences and again today the absolute you know, meteoric rise of research coming out of the, from the emerging markets and China taking over from the US in certain disciplines. And I think, well, in, in the audience's experience, are, are researchers from those emerging markets 
equally engaged with open access? Do they have the funds to pay the open access fees? How is that going to shift over time? By 2027, will, will they be as well equipped to pay open access charges and therefore facilitate the, the publication of their material? Will they have kind of gone their own way and, and set up their own systems, actually? I mean, why do they, why do you know, we sitting here in, um, in Britain need to be kind of telling them what to do anyway on publishing their output? So I'd, I'd, I'd like to throw this one out, really, to talk to, to publishers, to get some views from publishers who do deal with, with submissions from all over the world and have seen particular growth in submissions from developing parts of the emerging markets and what they think might happen over that period of time, those dynamics. Anybody prepared to make a comment? Susan, is there a mic? Oh, sure. <laughs> Sorry, it's coming. <laughs> you could face the camera. That'd be oh, thank you. right. Um, yes, I. We've done. Susan is at the London Mathematical yeah, Society. Sorry, yes. London Mathematical Society. We've done a very small survey on a very small journal of authors to ask them about this, um, and. <coughs> The only slightly interesting thing that came out of it was that the um, authors from the northern African, so um, Arabic countries um, and uh, the Middle East were the ones who seemed most inclined to consider author charges when there's a huge antipathy um, to it from all the other mathematicians. So. Mm. Interesting. Hello. I hate, I hate, uh, Della Sarr from the Nature Publishing Group. Um, I think it's well known that we're now publishing um, a number of nature branded journals and non nature branded journals which do give authors quite a significant amount of choice. And our journal Nature Communications actually has leapt up the impact factors. I was at a nature board meeting last week and the largest number of submissions for that journal are coming from China. I'm not saying they're the largest number of publications, but certainly the largest number of submissions prepared to pay the full APC are now coming from China. Yeah. And uh, so I can only imagine that uh, within less than five years, we're going to see uh, a massive change in the distribution of papers published from that area, which we believe certainly um, deserve to be published in the Nature Branded Journal. For our um, non-Nature Branded Journal um, scientific reports, we are not getting nearly as many papers. So when we have uh, questioned the uh, reason for that, we're told that scientists in China um, will get so much kudos from publishing in any journal with a Nature Brand that they are prepared to find the money to send um, their papers to Nature Communications, but not to our other journal because it doesn't carry the, the brand. And do you think that will still be the, the case in 2027? Or do you think that they might be thinking, well, hang on, why are we sending all these article processing fees to London when we could be doing it ourselves? I think in the case of Nature, or 2027, who knows? <laughs> uh, I, I just hope I'm still around somewhere to, to find out myself. Um, I don't know. I think, I think the nature brand, it may not, and, and this is not uh, NPG strategy, I'm not revealing anything here. I think the nature brand in terms of just being a journal title might mean something entirely different. Um, I think it, it could mean a whole number of services. I think it could mean papers. I think it could mean all sorts of, of data. Um, but I think the nature brand itself, hopefully, will still be attracting uh, those papers. And I don't think it makes any difference that it's London. I don't think it's made any difference to 96% of the world that nature is perceived perhaps to be published out of London. I, I, I think that's totally irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Can I, although, here, here, here. <laughs> although I had uh, enough uh, attention, I think, but uh, I want to make a little caveat on what on the on this statement about nature. I don't think it's so much. Of course, the nature brand is a great brand, and people will choose that for that reason. But I think it's more important that uh, the Chinese need to publish in impact factored Western journals at this moment that they get their funding for that. Because also at Biomed Central, I can tell you, uh, uh, not a majority, but a very large part of uh, open access publications there come from China, and that will develop further, I'm sure. 
And of course there will be a tendency in China to publish these themselves, uh, to, to have their own publishing houses, but that's fair. That's what we did in, 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 in Europe and the US also. Um, so I think uh, there is actually, uh, in China, there is open access money available already. Every, every mm -hmm. Chinese scientist has a thousand dollar about to, uh, in his funding to, uh, to publish with open access. So I think it has not so much to do with open access again. Uh, open access is only a business model. It has to do with the fact that at this moment the leading journals are in the UK and Europe and, and the United States. Well, actually, just on that very last point that you made, I think that that's changing as we speak. I mean, certainly when I was uh, in life sciences, we were beginning to launch journals that were, how should I put it, absolutely standard, good business models and high quality, but they were coming out of China and that those Chinese editors had the networks in the West to get their US editorial board members or whatever, but they emanate, they originate in China. I think what we'll actually see in 2027 is They'll, be, they'll have their whole publishing industry and they'll have their own journals and they're clearly coming up to our standards quite quickly. I mean, in the physical sciences they were doing it in the early noughties and now life sciences is catching up. Mm. So. And uh, we, we often think about the rewards associated with journal publication as being reputational, don't we? In, 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 in that, 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 that is normal and very indirectly financial. You know, if you, if you publish enough papers in good places, you get promoted. So it's, it's financial, but it's an indirect relationship. Well, you know, in certain countries, including you know certain Chinese institutions or funders, scientists are being directly financially rewarded for publishing in Nature or other journals. You know, they're getting a bonus in their salary. So that is partly driving behaviour as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Bottom line, we talk. <laughs> Did any other uh, publishers that want to make a comment on that about the the, the maybe the shift in submissions or the balance of activities in different parts of the world? Hello, Jennifer Goyby, the UP. Um, so I manage nucleic acid research, which is our um, fully open access journal that was converted from subscription journal. So I just had a point to make about um, sort of geographical distribution of the finances. Um, on NAR, we run a waiver scheme for authors who are unable to pay, and we have a sort of formal list of developing countries, but the waiver scheme operates outside of that. And it used to be the case that most of the waiver requests we got were from people in the so-called emerging markets, developing economies. And actually, in recent years, um, what I've noticed is that it's much more people in the mature markets and the developing economies who are saying, ah, my grant money is now running out, and I don't have the same resources I did have before, so now I need a waiver or a discount. And the people here in the emerging economies actually already have the money there to do so. So they're, it's kind of, I guess that's, you know, that's an economic thing as much as anything else with the recession. But, um, yeah, well, or an indication that, that if, if, if the researcher values it enough, they will, they will find the money. Yeah, the exactly. will find the money. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's an interesting, interesting point. And it does make you think that maybe by 2027, mm -hmm. you know, the, the concept of the emerging market might be quite different. Um, it might apply to different countries. So I think we're just going to, to, to wrap, oh sorry, is there one more comment at the back before we? Hi Andrea, Adrian, um, one of the things in Charlie's presentation was about getting closer to the end users and your customers, so how are publishers aiming to do that with, with people in China or India? You know, it seems like materials just come into them, but, but what sort of outreach are they doing? And, and as sort of a caveat on that, I think there is a sort of role or a scope for helping sort of educate, um, there's certainly a lot of language polishing companies and people who are working in those areas, but, but publishers and editors sort of working more closely, looking at rejection rates and, and giving feedback to them. Um, I think there's a sense mm. there's a bit of a rush to be published by, by some of the Chinese authors, so mm. I'd be interested to hear what the, uh, the publishers are doing to get closer to their audience and customers. Yeah, I mean, we absolutely have, and we've been doing it for several years, and if you take China, but in fact everywhere, I mean, we've had a, an outreach program of trying to have workshops and, um, and groups from authors, editors, reviewers and users for many, many years. A lot of those were live, but clearly, clearly they weren't scalable. So obviously, I think most publishers now have big programs of webinars and, and various ways that they can communicate. Um, and a lot of those have, you know, Q&A sessions where they can, like we're doing now with the Twitter feeds, where people can actually interact. So yes, absolutely, we're doing outreach. And I think... Uh, it's something that's taken more and more of our, our time and budget and to get close to customers. And of course, analytics as well, uh, and metrics, and deciding mm. do people care about alt metrics or not, and mm. what, what's the most appropriate measure. 
And actually, just, just to, to turn it to, back to, to Stephen, because of course, the University of Nottingham has had a campus in China for, mm. for many years, and, and that's a very interesting relationship that you've fostered with colleagues uh, in that location. I don't yeah. know whether you, you get involved in educating them about the, the publishing process. And not specifically about the publishing process, but certainly being involved in research collaborations mm -hmm. and having a, having a base. I mean, the Nottingham campus in China is now quite mature. It's set up in 2004, uh, has its own greenfield site, um, uh, has about 6,000 students there. Um, and, you know, as, along with uh, the campus in Malaysia, which has about 5,000, there's a significant proportion of Nottingham students. Mm. Uh, you know, so that you know that that's really important. That the, the, the reflection of the sort of growth of Chinese authors in journals is a reflection of the growth of the HE and research uh, institutions in China in, in in general. And you know, Chinese institutions are now actively recruiting staff from the West to go and work in mm. in China. Uh, in, you know, particularly in the science, technology, medicine areas. Um, you know that, that that's something that, that that's happening, and uh, having a base in China, we, in Ningbo, which is quite near Shanghai, has been a really interesting experience to see that uh, the growth of the HE and research sector within within China. More institutions are now doing it. Nottingham um, was one of the first, but it certainly won't be uh, the last to do that kind of uh, thing because that's where it's all happening. It's a massive market for HE. Um, and it's a, a real growth area in terms of research. <coughs> oh, Ian? <laughs> Thanks, Ian Russell from OUP again. Um, I've got a question for, for, for all of the panel, really, and indeed people in the audience, but I guess primarily aimed at Stephen. Um, do you think that there will be any sort of change in author behaviour? I mean, I know researchers are used to competing for funds, in, you know, for research funds from the research councils, but it seems with the RCUK policy, suddenly they're going to be competing for, potentially for, for open access funds from the, administered by their own institution. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I hear some academics voicing concerns, you know, what happens if the money runs out halfway through the yeah. year, those sorts of arguments. Do you think there's going to be any change in researcher behaviour when potentially um, a researcher will be competing with the academic sat next door to them um, for open access funds administered by the university? Mm. I think uh, uh, it's difficult to say, but I think all institutions and everybody involved in this kind of discussion are now thinking through what the, what the implications are for scaling, what a number of institutions have been doing, but all on, on a small scale. I mean, the Nottingham uh, Open Access Fund so far is covering no more than 5% of Nottingham's total output. You know, so it's mm. small scale. Mm. When you start saying, well, what happens if we start covering 50%? What are the consequences? And, and also, what are the unintended consequences? So competition amongst authors might be one of them. And it really depends how the institution is administering it. And also, you know, I think the way you think about this, if you think about the cost of communication as part of the cost of research, it kind of changes the mindset because it, it then says we have to reserve a proportion of the budget for this kind of activity, which is actually a tiny proportion of the overall research budget, but it's still an important part of it. If, if it meant if some scientists published a little bit less, well, maybe that would be a kind of a good thing, uh, you know, some would argue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, and I, I, think it, I think it's really interesting, this, because most of the research assessment processes that I know of are actually not covering quantity of publication, they're covering quality, you know, the, the ref, you only have to submit four mm. publications for five years worth of work. It's not encouraging quantity and yet some cultures within academic disciplines almost say the more papers the better, you know, I've published 10 papers, I've published 15 mm. papers this year, kind of thing. So maybe there'll be some good changes as well as challenges. And actually, a different, a different sort of wrinkle on that is where the authors, the co-authors, are from different institutions, from multiple institutions. Are the institutions going to sort of work together to work out well who who picks up the the path? Yeah, yeah. yeah it does. Already, it does already happen. Yeah, it I does, heard that from it the. Does, yeah. mm -hmm. It's often the corresponding author or yeah. any other other things. So mm -hmm. it's, they, they, yeah. the assumption is it'll just it'll level itself out yeah, over the course of time. So. Right. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, we're we're. Hand over there. Oh, oh, oh sorry, Ben. 
Hello. Oh, you know my name now, which is concerning <laughs> or, or a good thing. Um, could I query that statistic? Um, you said um, I, I work for an engineering uh, institution, so you said that at Nottingham, just to take an example, engineers were less than 10% of requests, but then you just said that your OA fund yeah. covered 5% of total output. Yeah. So is it 10% of 5%, which means it's very low for journal papers? from engineers? Uh, yeah, uh, so t it's less than 10, considerably less than 10%, I can't remember the exact figures, uh, of the usage of the fund, the numbers of people requesting use of the fund that I was talking about there. So I don't know what percentage of output engineers are compared to the whole institution, mm -hmm. so I couldn't judge that, but it's, I was talking about usage of the, of the fund. Mm -hmm. uh, the interesting thing about that is I don't think institutions know enough about their output. You know, it's a ridiculous thing to say. This is the primary product of, apart from graduates, it's the primary product <laughs> of universities. And, and universities today have really been very laissez-faire in, in how they've, you know, allowed all of this to happen. I think universities are starting to now get a bit more savvy about not managing that so much as just being aware and, and getting more from that asset. Um, you know, and universities need to be better at that. Okay, great. Well, we are coming towards the end of, uh, of our allotted time, and I just want to finish up with one last question, um, which is about how are we going to make it all happen? And how are we going to work together, collaboratively, as we've uh, said, to, to ensure that the, uh, the transition to open access is an orderly one, and that it does protect and preserve what we all hold to be of, of value uh, within our, our world. So. What do, do you think, uh, the panellists, you know, who, who should take the lead maybe in bringing together the different parts of this ecosystem we've been describing? Is this a role for the uh, learned societies or for the uh, trade associations? Is it a role for um, just individual interest groups? So who, who do you think should really issue the rallying call? I'm not sure it's, uh, it's one individual group. I mean, clearly, obviously, publishers um, and societies and, and the institutions have to work together and come up with some kind of something out of the chaos so there's some kind of order, standards, processes, protocols or, or at least sizing the problem. Um, whether that will happen or, or not, I mean I think people have to forget their differences. I mean obviously this, the open access debate has been a bloody battle. Um, but I think I think it will come together. I think you know li library groups will come together with publishers, and those debates will take place. Whether or not you need to force that and actually say, look, we need to have an agenda over the next 18 months, I don't know. Um, I, I mean, we know. I think we heard from Vim that the uh, Finch report is going to meet in six months to, to evaluate mm. and see what's happened. Um, I'm, I'm intrigued by that comment. Are they just going to come back, come into a room, and say, okay, guys, so what's what's happened in the past six months? But on the other hand, I would also say that maybe the, when I say market decides, maybe we should just see what players come into the ecosystem to provide these services to actually facilitate it happening. Um, but I think underlying that, there's also training, and that goes back to your skills point, which is, you know, all groups, publishers, librarians, and, and, and indeed researchers, I think do need some help getting along that way. Um, I would certainly say publishers do, you know, some of them are still quite traditional. Mm. Um, so I think it's going to be a mix of kind of organised chaos, I think. I <laughs> yeah, I see, I see that as important. I think it's a combination of allowing innovation to take place, allowing, uh, you know, individual initiative, individual companies, individual institutions, individual researchers to take the initiative and to do interesting stuff, but doing that in a context where you can also take the, the bigger policies forward as well. And I think a lot of, uh, the, you know, when you look at policy initiatives from funders and so on, a lot of that has happened within that context of innovation and debate. So it's not saying, well, all of that debate was just hot air. I think that debate has informed the policies. Everybody mm -hmm. said, okay, after all of this debate, and it has been bloody, mm -hmm. but quite enjoyable at mm -hmm. times, yeah. um, you know, uh, I've enjoyed it anyway. Um, you know, what, what, can we, what can we achieve? How can we go forward together on this? And as long as everybody's prepared to work together, and I think they are, yeah. you know, even yeah. sometimes where they disagree, yeah. then, and Finch kind of proves that, actually, mm -hmm. um, that then, you know, we can, go, we can go forward. And we, a lot has been achieved in the last decade. When you, you know, it, I don't think we'd have had a presentation from somebody like Vim 
you know, somebody representing a large scale commercial publisher like we had this morning um, 10 years ago. Well, we just wouldn't, would we? So a lot has been achieved, but it's been achieved through that combination of interesting innovation debate on the one hand and, you know, policy and coordinated action on the other. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? on preservation and persistence and we're talking about things like big data, we're talking about new models but the metadata that, that we're all quite good at, that we've all done quite well for the last, it was all the traditional metadata. Now moving that forward without standards and the responsibilities of who might get involved in that from a where is the stuff that's going to be published in open access going to be in 17 years and who is curating that? Mm -hmm. So important for organisations possibly like Crossref and other sort of intermediary groups who, uh, who can impo in impose um, some rigour and discipline in the process. Yeah. Yeah, I was yeah. just going to add a point. There's really four parties here and so we've got the publishers, we've got the funding agencies who are mandating, mandating open access and we've got libraries and information specialists. But the key group are the researchers who basically just want to get on and do research. Yeah. And mm -hmm. how easy or difficult it is, I think that's going to be one of the, the driving forces about the pace of change. Because the other parties, we could all get it sorted, but unless we make it easy for researchers mm. so that we're not putting barriers in the way. And uh, after the RC UK policy came out, the thing we heard almost within minutes was, hang on, this is going to change my behaviour and things are good up to now. Why is it having to change? Mm. And uh, I think that's the unintended consequences that uh, we've heard about. Mm. Well, that's, I think that's a really good place to stop actually because I think what Jim's reminding us all is that at the end of the day we're serving our customers and I think Cameron made the point quite forcefully yesterday that we haven't always made it easy for them to do their work and uh, I think we need to make sure that we get better at uh, serving our user needs. So I'd like to thank you all for your participation. I'd particularly like to thank our panellists today. I think they, 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 they took on a challenge very gamely and I think they very much uh, lived up to, the, to our hopes and expectations. So thank you. <laughs>